welcome to Shattering This, a program devoted to the most important and fastest growing segment of our society. To those who know that the world's political, religious, media, military, and economic institutions are corrupt, including those in America, and that they are all counterproductive, they cannot be fixed. Our mission, therefore, is to look behind the headlines, to know who is working against our interests, to understand why they're doing so. Because exposing and condemning errant and treacherous schemes isn't hateful. It's caring. In our concluding hour, we're going to use evidence and reason to explore the Torah, which means teaching, not law, because its liberating and empowering covenant provides the only reliable answer for you and for your family. Our phone number, if you'd like to participate in this discussion any time over the next three hours, is 877-300-7645. I do want to begin this week by saying that last week was probably my favorite uh, week on this show, and it was made special because of the callers. It is those of you listening to the program that picked up the phone and joined in the discussion that uh, made this past week so meaningful, and so I would encourage you to continue to participate. This is not a sports show. Uh, I uh, have uh, announced on previous occasions that I am a sports fan. Um, I, and yesterday was uh, obviously the single biggest sporting event in the world in terms of uh, viewership. I was not a, a neutral observer. Uh, Paul Allen, who owns the Seattle Seahawks, was the largest investor in my last company. Uh, he is the co-founder of Microsoft. Uh, I got to know him reasonably well. He was uh, especially uh, engaging and supportive uh, in um, my last uh, business endeavor. I know um, Pete Carroll. He was a neighbor. Um, I went to uh, USC, so I am particularly fond of what uh, Pete Carroll did at USC. Um, and... The other thing that I like about uh, Seattle is the fact that, from my perspective, the single most empowering attribute is a good attitude. It's what uh, God seems to like as well. The Seattle players were all flawed in one way or another. The most valuable player of the game was a uh, an SC uh, player, a linebacker, who didn't even get invited to the NFL Combine, which is the pre-draft testing opportunity to introduce uh, potential um, NFL players from college ranks to the pros. Didn't even get invited. He was a seventh round draft pick. The most important player on the defense was a um, fifth round draft pick. The offense is filled with guys who were passed over. You look at even Russell Wilson, the quarterback, third round draft pick. The uh, Two most prolific receivers for Seattle were not drafted. They were passed over by every team. It is uh, sort of the island of misfit toys, of outcasts, of rejects. But Pete Carroll instilled in that team the right kind of attitude, working together, um, devotion. It reminds me a lot of, uh, of and I don't want to suggest for a moment that Pete Carroll is a uh, is a participant in the uh, the covenant and that he knowingly is applying the same um, standards but Pete Carroll says you know when you really genuinely care for people then and you you work with people so that you put them in a position where they can achieve their best um, standing always beside them trying to lift them up, that you get uncommon uh, production. Uh, you look at the covenant, that's Yahweh's idea. Wants to lift us up, wants to empower us, wants to put us in a position where we have the best opportunity to be all that we can be. And yet, most participants in the covenant, and even those who spoke on behalf of Yahweh, are flawed individuals, all with with uh, issues that would cause them to be rejected by most. You know, I do this program, and I've got no attribute that would be considered particularly uh, uh, meaningful. Uh, I'm not don't claim any qualifications that would impress anyone. Flawed like everyone else. You know, God likes to work with flawed people, likes to engage with them, finds us entertaining. 
And, you know, you're never going to find in the covenant someone that society rallies around. You're never going to see the popular achievers. There'll be no leading politicians, no generals, no media stars, no uh, religious leaders in heaven. It is, it is a, a collection of individuals like uh, Seattle that are outcasts from everyone else's perspective that uh, have been empowered and enriched and have the opportunity to work together as a family. I saw a lot of that in Seattle, and so I had an affinity for them throughout the season. I was glad to see them win. A friend of mine uh, this morning sent me an email that I want to share relative to the Super Bowl. It, uh, it reads, uh, Fox News' tradition of reading the Declaration of Independence before the Super Bowl was troubling. This year there was a direct tie-in between the U.S. military and the idea that they are the ones who carried forward and fulfilled the responsibility of protecting our freedoms. It begins with the soldier solemnly looking into the camera and saying, the obligations to our country never ceases but with our lives. Religious devotion. He wrote funny that they didn't feel compelled to include Jefferson, who was the author of the Declaration of Independence, warning about the greatest threat to a country's freedom being that of a established military. I wonder how people would have reacted to the truth had it been told. Yeah, here's a, a group of military uh, uh, soldiers reading the Declaration of Independence as if they were the guardians of it. And the author of the Declaration of Independence considered the military the single greatest threat to the nation's freedom. In 1786, Jefferson wrote, Of all of the enemies to public liberty, war is perhaps the most to be dreaded, because it comprises and develops the germ of every other. War is the parent of established militaries. From these proceed debts and taxes, and armies and debts and taxes are the known instruments for bringing the many under the domination of the few. In war, too, the discretionary power of the executive is extended. Its influence in dealing out offices, honors, and money is multiplied. And all of the means of seducing the minds are added to those of subduing the force of the people. The same malignant aspect in republicanism may be traced in the inequality of fortunes and the opportunities for fraud growing out of a state of war and in the degeneracy of manners, of morals, endangered by both. No nation could preserve its freedom in the midst of continual warfare. Jefferson uh, equated this to established militaries throughout his writings. And he said, in essence, that if you have an established military, you will use it, and you will be in a constant state of war. America, since the first Europeans invaded this continent, have engaged in 101 wars, one every four years. Jefferson's nightmare has become our reality. And we have taken sporting events now, and we have brought them into the uniform presentation of propaganda. The U.S. military is not protecting and preserving American freedoms. They're robbing Americans of their freedoms. They don't fight for America's freedom. They engage universally, making bad situations worse. It is way past time that we as a nation eliminate our military. We don't need it. It not only doesn't do us any good, it is counterproductive. If we instead were simply to do what Jefferson wanted, to have the Bill of Rights expressly forbid the establishment of a military, and instead to honor the Fourth Amendment, and to enable Americans to keep and bear arms, the kind of arms that would be used 
for militias. America would never have its liberty threatened. It would be impossible for any country to invade and occupy the nation. Similarly, if we're going to have any hope for freedom, in addition to eliminating the United States military, we must also eliminate the spying agencies, the NSA, the CIA, military intelligence, and along with them the National Police Force of Homeland Security, including the ATF, the FBI. It's long past time that we recognize that these are not protectors of freedom, they are destroyers of freedom. There was an article that came out this morning, too, that uh, was troubling uh, to me. Uh, the article is, uh, is reasonably accurate. They just don't know what about the article is wrong. Most of the commercials during the Super Bowl were uh, fuzzy, feel-good kind of uh, commercials, particularly, boy, look how wonderful we are in America. One commercial, the product is a, uh, is a rubber mat, rubber mats that go into the trunks and uh, footwells of cars. It's about as simple a product as you can make. There are no moving parts. In fact, each each product is simply uh, rubber in a mold. And they're bragging about it. They said you couldn't manufacture in America. They said that, oh, no, American labor is too expensive. You couldn't make this kind of quality. For God's sake, we're talking about a rubber mat. And then so many of the other commercials were just simply feel good. It's as if we have reached the stage in our society where if you play happy music and you show people happy images, that they'll be happy. That if they identify feel good music and feel good imagery with your product, they won't bother to think about its features or its value or its competitiveness or why they should spend their money on buying it. They want to feel good, just like your product is associated with feel good. It's really pathetic what we have become. We'll return to Shattering Miss after the commercial break. Shattering Miss, I am Yana. We encourage you to participate in this uh, program, 877-300-7645. This next story um, is among the most important uh, that we could consider. It's a simple statement from uh, one lone individual, and yet what it affirms has been the crux of what I have been trying to convey for over three years uh, specifically regarding Syria, and for now 12 years uh, regarding the nature of terrorism. When the world identifies terrorists with al-Qaeda, and that the, the war is against al-Qaeda, and that they are al-Qaeda linked, then we are deceiving ourselves. We are fighting a battle against a irrelevant symptom. We're missing the fact that fundamentalist Islam, the Islam of Muhammad, the Islam of the Islamic scriptures, the Islam of the Quran, the Islam of the Hadith, which are the oral reports from Muhammad and his companions about the words and deeds of Muhammad, that fundamentalist Islam is a terrorist dogma. It is a declaration of war against all humankind. Every Islamic terrorist has one thing in common, Islam. They have not corrupted their religion. Their religion has corrupted them. Not my opinion. That's irrefutable fact. The only thing that separates the world from this truth is ignorance and an incapacity to think rationally. That and a steady stream of lies by our politicians, by our military, 
by religious leaders, by almost everyone. The primary um, terrorist group that has is always linked to Al Qaeda is uh, was first known as the Islamic State in Iraq. It is now the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. And it is always just simply presented as Al-Qaeda's affiliate. It is, it is, it is connected with Al-Qaeda more often than any other terrorist group in the world. E even more often than the two uh, Islamic terrorist groups that actually incorporate the Al-Qaeda name into their name. Uh, there's uh, essentially a website that uh, has maybe 20 members associated with it. Um, was at one time as many as 200, but most of them are dead, uh, called uh, Al-Qaeda of the Arabian Peninsula. That's simply a website capitalizing on the name to get traffic to the site. And then there is Al-Qaeda of the Maghreb, which is uh, the, uh, the base in uh, the, uh, this zone of northern Africa um, that was substantially empowered uh, by America's uh, foolishness relative to Libya and arming the Libyan jihadists. But the number one terrorist organization in the world linked to al-Qaeda has been the Islamic State in Iraq and now either called the Islamic State in Iraq or the and Syria or the Levant, uh, ISIS or ISIL. And what I have uh, said repeatedly is that there is really no connection between the Islamic State in uh, Iraq and the uh, uh, and Al Qaeda. When Americans uh, went in to uh, to kill Bin Laden, they didn't go to capture him. They went in to kill him because uh, at a trial, Bin Laden would have demonstrated that our war against Al Qaeda was a complete hoax, a complete fraud. Uh, and that Al Qaeda was meaningless in this uh, in this effort. But when we raided his home and killed him, the American uh, special forces units came away with uh, his correspondence, and a hundred percent of his of Osama bin Laden's, the founder of Al Qaeda's correspondence, indicated that he had nothing to do with the Islamic State of Iraq. That he completely disavowed them. The same thing was true with the with Al Qaeda of the Arabian Peninsula. He completely disavowed them as well. Said he that they were not an offspring of uh, or an affiliate of his organization, that they did not have his franchise, that they they were not listening to him, that they had nothing to do with him. Well, now we have an absolute af affirmation from the one surviving uh, Al-Qaeda leader, Anwar al-Zawahiri, that the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria has no connection whatsoever to Al-Qaeda. To Shattering Mist, we're talking about a story that I'm going to share with you now. It is uh, reported by Reuters, who absolutely does not get it, but it doesn't matter and who you uh, uh, go to to read about this story. They're all lost in La La Land uh, as, uh, in terms of its implications. The Reuters story reads, Al-Qaeda's general command. Okay, first of all, uh, Al-Qaeda does not have a command. They had no command. They don't have any, you know, there's, this idea of command would be a command and control. That's the U.S. Uh, military uh, um, strategy, for example, command. And that means you have a headquarters, you have a hierarchy of, uh, of individuals, and you have uh, ranks of individuals below them that, uh, that carry out the orders of the higher-ups. Uh, and it, uh, command also... Uh, uh, insinuates that this hierarchy of having a headquarters and a protocol and a rank uh, is 
for military units. There is no Al-Qaeda army. There is no Al-Qaeda militia. There are no Al-Qaeda jihadists, even. There is nobody below the lone surviving spokesperson for Al-Qaeda. He is Anwar al-Zawahiri. He is an Egyptian, uh, someone who was very active in uh, jihad terrorism in Egypt. Uh, his primary and favorite targets uh, were to kill tourists uh, in, uh, in Egypt, uh, particularly tourists uh, visiting antiquities. So we begin with a, uh, a misnomer. It's not al-Qaeda's general command. It's the surviving member of al-Qaeda which is uh, uh, Amin al-Zawahiri. He said today that al-Qaeda had no links of any kind, never had them, and does not have them, with the Islamic State in Iraq, and Reuters says, and the Levant, ISIL. Levant, by the way, is, a, uh, is an interesting term. The Levant is, uh, is more often used to describe uh, Israel. It's a, it's a term that those who know that Palestine is a completely bogus term, but, but still uh, can't bring themselves to say uh, Israel, or, or Yahuda, as the province was known during uh, Greek and Roman times, and prior to that, uh, throughout its history, and even after that, they can't. By the can't bring them themselves to say Yahuda, and they don't even like Israel. They just hate Israel. Uh, a lot of that's because they they're anti-Semitic, but most of it's because they don't like the uh, the God of Israel. They don't like Yahweh, and so they can't bear to say those things. So they use the term Levant, and Levant is is Israel, the Promised Land, but. Uh, the realization is, and we did a program on this, so I don't need to go into much depth here. The Islamic uh, State in Iraq and Syria uses the Arabic word for Syria in its name. So, since it's the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, why not say the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria? And if you're going to use a, an acronym, it would be ISIS, ISIS. It's after the Egyptian uh, god. Now, the other thing that is germane to this discussion is by saying Syria, they mean greater Syria. They mean the Syria uh, during the time of, uh, of the Sunni domination of much of the world. You know, for the first hundred years of Islam, it was dominated by Shia Islam and was managed out of uh, the Baghdad area. But soon... Uh, the Shias were defeated by the Sunnis, and the Sunnis got the hell out of Dodge, and they moved their headquarters from uh, ground zero for Shia Islam, which is still Iran, to Syria, and managed Islam from Damascus. And so Islam's period of domination of much of the world was out of Damascus, and so the, the Syria of the Islamic domination of the world, which is greater Syria, is what they mean by the Islamic State uh, in Iraq and Syria. Now, mind you, the name itself ought to tell you that they are uh, uh, devoted to Islam. It's not the Al-Qaeda State. It's the Islamic State. Well, here's a <laughs> Reuters statement. It's just amazingly stupid. Al-Qaeda's general command said on Monday that it had no links with the Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant in an apparent attempt to reassert its authority over fragmented Islamic fighters in Syria's civil war. <laughs> yeah. I, it, it's so stupid. It's beyond me that, that experts and journalists could write it. That's like saying, you know, I have absolutely no connection whatsoever, never had, never will, with uh, Premier. That's one of the largest uh, conglomerates, if you will, of radio stations and talk radio hosts, uh, also known as Clear Channel. Well, never had an association with them. 
uh, and I uh, don't currently have an association with them. So if I were to say I have had no and I have no association of any kind with Clear Channel and Premier, how would that be me attempting to reassert my authority over the organization that I have no association with whatsoever? Uh, it's it's like saying that uh, uh, that the President of the United States uh, saying that we have absolutely no links with Chile in an apparent attempt to reassert our authority over Chile. But nonetheless, that's that's how stupid. I mean, there is no other word for this other than moronic, utterly stupid that this statement is. So here is Al-Qaeda affirming what I've been saying for years, and the media perceives it as exactly the opposite of what they've said. After a month of rebel infighting, Al-Qaeda disavowed the increasingly independent ISIL in a move likely to bolster a rival Islamic group, the Nusra Front, as Al-Qaeda's official proxy in Syria. The Victory Front was not founded by Al-Qaeda. It's not a proxy. It's not an affiliate. And this idea that the Islamic State in Iraq is becoming increasingly independent suggests that they were once dependent. You know, when America invited, invaded Iraq, when we invaded Iraq, it wasn't a, this myth that George W. Bush promoted, that we had to invade Iraq because that's where Al-Qaeda was, that they were harboring Al-Qaeda, that there was an Al-Qaeda presence in Iraq that we had to go after. There was none. Osama bin Laden wanted to go to war against Saddam Hussein. Hated him. And Saddam Hussein was totally intolerant of Islamic fundamentalists. Because he knew the kind of terror that they breed. So the Islamic State in Iraq rose up to kill Americans. Independent of Al-Qaeda. It's not becoming increasingly independent. It was never dependent. Now, this reads, the switch is seen. <laughs> so, the myth that Al-Qaeda and that the Islamic State in Iraq, and now Syria, was the arm of Al-Qaeda, uh, and that now they're going to embrace al-Nusra, which is the victory front, is seen as a switch by those who are completely ignorant and irrational. The switch is seen as an attempt to do, redirect the Islamic effort towards unseating President Bashar al-Assad rather than waste resources in fighting other rebels, and could be intended to shift the strategic balance at a time when the government forces are increasingly active on the battlefield. It could also embolden Nusra, in its dispute with ISIL. Now, the release did not say anything about al-Nusra, the victory front. Didn't say a word. Al-Nusra has made their position abundantly clear. They've said that we are aligned only with Islam, that we fight in Allah's cause, that our goal is to establish Sharia law and an Islamic state in Syria and beyond. They have been emphatic, as clear as words allow, as to what they are, with whom they are allied, which is with Islam, Allah, Muhammad. Now, the fact of the matter is that the forces that are fighting President Bashar al-Assad, are exclusively Sunni jihadists, and they come from around the world. They are not being inspired by al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is irrelevant to them. They're inspired by Sunni Islam's hatred of Shia Islam. 
It's a 1,300-year civil war between the two of them. What they see is the opportunity that's being presented by their imams, their preachers, that if they engage in this great jihad, this great moment in history, that they will not only prevail in wiping out Shia Islam and replacing it with Sunni Islam so that the entire world of Islam is unified, but that from that base of unification, that they will first be able to attack Israel and then Europe and the United States. That is their goal. They are very upfront with that goal. That's who they are. And if you don't understand who they are and why they're fighting and what their goals are, then you have no chance of understanding what's happening in the world or how to protect yourself and your family from it. You have no idea why our government is making bad situations worse. This reads ISIL. They don't like to actually write out the name because the name is a dead giveaway. The Islamic State in Iraq and Syria has fought battles with other Islamic insurgents, no, with Islamist jihadists in the secular and secular rebel groups. There are no secular rebel, rebel groups, often triggered by disputes over authority and territory. Several secular and Islamist groups announced a campaign last month against the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. We'll get back to what that actually means in a moment. Welcome back to Shattering Mess. The reason that uh, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria has been warring against other uh, Islamic jihadist groups in Syria, including uh, al-Nusra, is the fact that even Muslims of the same sect, Sunni Muslims, fight and kill other Sunni Muslims. Uh, and they do so because it, it's all about a grab for power. It's, it isn't much different than the discomfort that Eastern Orthodox, uh, Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, or Copt Christians have with the Roman Catholic Church. It's a, their religion don't differ. Same playbook, same, uh, same corruption. It's just who's in charge. And so that's really the only issue in this battle between the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria and the Nusra Front. Uh, reading from exactly the same playbook, they're, they're both fundamentalist Muslims, they're both jihadists, they're both mujahideen, they're both savages. They both want exactly the same thing. And state, they want the same thing. And they're willing to behead anyone, rape anyone, um, enslave anyone, torture anyone who stands in their way. Their stated goals are to establish a unified Islamic state in Syria and throughout the region with a central chain of command that is based upon the Quran, the establishment of Sharia law, and then to lead conquests of the rest of the world from that base. Now, rebel on rebel, they call it, and these aren't rebels, they're Islamic jihadists. They are Sunni jihadists that are fighting the government, and the government is comprised of, of um, standard army units, and Hezbollah, which is a Shia terrorist group managed out of Tehran, Iran. But they say rebel on rebel violence as opposed to Sunni jihadist on Sunni jihadist violence in Syria has killed at least 2,300 people this year alone. Now, mind you, this year is just over a month old, 2,300 this year alone according to the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights uh, in their monitoring group. Now, the reality is, them killing one another is probably a good thing. That probably is a good thing. You know, if they kill one another, 
then they are not killing innocent people. And they're, they're, it's one corrupt group of religious thugs killing another corrupt group of religious thugs. It keeps that corrupt group of religious thugs from killing innocent people. We ought not intervene. But we ought to understand who the players are, because the United States, through Saudi Arabia and Qatar, wants to arm these repulsive individuals. The ISIS, uh, they write in this, ISIL, follows al-Qaeda's hardline ideology. Good gracious, what's wrong with people? They don't follow al-Qaeda's hardline ideology. They follow fundamentalist Islamic ideology. And until we come to grips with that, until we can actually say that, until it becomes permissible to tell the truth, then the world is going to continue to devolve into nothing but a series of one terrorist attack after another. Until now, the two groups were officially linked. No, they weren't. One claimed dominion over the other. The other claimed independence from it. They had no official links. They immediately disavowed links. Many foreign fighters and uh, ISIS, they say ISIL observers, however, say that Al-Qaeda Central and <laughs> Al-Qaeda Central. You know, the Washington Post was at least honest enough to say that there is no Al-Qaeda Central. It's simply Ayman al-Zawahiri making a post on uh, his website. And uh, ISIL had, uh, in fact, been effectively separated since before the group, uh, which had originally the al-Qaeda branch in Iraq, and it spread into Syria. So many foreign, I want to read this again. Many foreign fighters and ISIL observers, however, say that al-Qaeda Central and ISIL had in fact been effectively separated since before the, uh, the group, which was originally established as Al-Qaeda as branch in Iraq, went into Syria. Yeah, you know, they were. They were separated before the Islamic State of Iraq became the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria because they were never connected.